Uh, so I'm really excited about this meeting because it's going to be my first agent force focused talk like after all the rebranding, all the evolution that we got after Dreamforce from Copilot to Agent Force. And I spent like quite a big amount of time working on the slides. So, and the story, so I can tell you like everything in a way that is understandable. So I hope that you enjoyed the meeting. And as always, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. You can unmute yourself, whatever you need. Okay, I'm here to try to respond to your questions. I may not be, not know all responses, but I will try my, my best. Okay, so uh, first I need to include a forward looking statement because I work for Salesforce and uh, as agent force is something like very, very new, I will definitely make some forward looking statements. I will talk about features that are beta or pilot. And this just means that you should make purchasing decisions based on the features that are GA. Um, so agent force, this is the biggest announcement at Dreamforce. And it's not only that, but the number one company focus. So Mark Benioff really believes in agents and in the technology that we have developed. He believes this is the time to adopt agents. He believes we have a big market opportunity that we can quickly um, adapt to because of the foundations of the Salesforce platform and how it's been integrated with agents. So we are trying to enable, enable everyone, like partners, customers, everyone out there, because he really believes this is a huge change in the technology landscape. And that's why the company is going this direction. So what's agent force, right? In Dreamforce, I saw some sessions in which people said, well, Agent Force is just a rebranding of Copilot. And that's not exactly true. Okay. I would say, I would frame it better saying that Agent Force is the evolution of Copilot because Copilot was the first thing that we released and it had like an underlying technology, but all our research teams have been working really hard on improving the technology under Copilot and also the term agent force encompasses a few more things. And I'm going to try to, try to clarify all this today, step by step, okay? If you joined the session that I did with you a few months ago, we were able to see like prompt builder quite quite in depth, right? And then we spent a few minutes talking about Copilot, but we didn't have a lot of time because prompt builder is yeah, like already uh, a lot, right? To talk about and time ran out and I couldn't demo it like properly, but hopefully uh, in the last months, you've seen some demos of Copilot, okay? So Copilot, was meant to be an assistive internal agent that can elaborate a plan of actions to help somebody who's working in Salesforce, right? Like a Salesforce employee, some, somebody who's using the org, somebody who's authenticated in the org. That's why we say it's internal. So in contrast, agent force is a group of autonomous agents, right? That can be internal or external because there are some agents that can be exposed on experienced cloud sites, for instance, that can elaborate again and execute a plan of actions to help the internal person, the employee, or the external person fulfill their request, okay? And we're going to see which agents we have available now and which agents are coming. And it happens that one of those agents is the first internal copilot that we released. 
but the term agent force encloses like four different types of agents now. Then when we were working with the initial version of Copilot, you could create actions that the Copilot could execute in your org and you assigned the actions to the Copilot directly. So each agent or Copilot, you are going to see me use agent and Copilot interchangeably many times today. Uh, so that thing that does the actions for you had all the actions available and that's it, right? That's the, the, uh, the tool belt of things it could do in the earth for you. With Agent Force, we have introduced a new layer in the middle that help, helps categorize what the user wants to do better. It's like an intermediate step before going to the actions, right? And reduce the context and the number of actions that agents have available based on a definition of a topic, which is a job to be done. You're going to see this much better with, with an example. So this is, we define each agent. Now it's going to have topics, different topics, which are jobs to be done. And instead of assigning the actions to the agent directly, we are going to assign the actions to to each topic. And then the planner is going to be able to identify which topic do, does it want to use to fulfill the customer request or the employee request. And then it's going to use only the actions that are part of that topic. So we are like, um, I, I don't, the, the word in English doesn't come to my mind, but I, 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 we are like reducing the scope of things that the agent can do thanks to this classific topic classification that we do at the beginning. And this is something that we have um, found. It works really well by research, 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 research. We have a lot of teams researching how everything works internally. And this is like what we found with experimentation and what we have found successful. Then Copilot used GPT-4 Turbo to elaborate the plan of actions and um, also to like elaborate responses and so on. In Agent Force, we use something new. It's called the Atlas Reasoning Engine. And this is a, a proprietary a engine. It's it's the planner. We call it the planner, which uses several different large language models to um, find out the user intent, do topic classification, elaborate the plan of actions, and execute them. So it's something like much more advanced that what we had before. I'm, I'm going to get into the details of what Atlas Reasoning Engine does differently later. And then in Copilot, we could do some basic grounding, like we could ground prompt templates, for instance, with Apex, Flow, and um, Merge Fields. But now in Agent Force, we have like a lot more advanced functionality, which is mostly based on retrieval or multi generation and that helps doing semantic search on the platform and adding much more context to the agents. And it's been demonstrated that agents are able to complete their jobs much better and much faster thanks to all these innovations that we've included. One of the innovations as well is that now agents like the Atlas Reasoning Engine can do web search, okay? It can surf the web to try to respond to questions if needed. Okay, so let's go step by step. Let's talk about the suite of autonomous agents. What, that does, what that, does that mean, right? So we have the employee copilot, which is the first agent that was released, is the simplest one. Why? Because it's always 
acting on the platform, from within the platform. So if a user asks something to the employee copilot, the employee copilot knows which user is asking. And it's able to identify that user and run actions on behalf of the user. And this is GA. Then uh, we have another agent, which is GA, which is the agent force service agent. And these agents that I'm going to talk about are like vertical agents, right? Same as industries are like vertical clouds. Consider these as vertical agents. Why? Because they are... Uh, designed for specific use cases, business use cases. And this one is designed for customer support. The idea is to have this agent available in an externally exposed channel. It could be an experienced cloud server. It could be also your WhatsApp channel or Facebook or whatever channel you are exposing and using in service cloud. It uses service cloud, of course, and optionally experienced cloud if you're using a site, and it's also GA. And today we are going to focus in the, in these two because are the two that are available and that you can uh, use today. But know that on December, there are two more coming uh, to GA, which are sales uh, SDR, which means sales development representative, and sales coach. So sales SDR is going to be an agent which is designed to um, outreach your inbound leads automatically. So you don't need, sometimes sales agents are overwhelmed and cannot respond to all the inbound leads that arrive to them. So with these agents, you can like proactively start the conversations with those leads automatically, like making the agent do that for you, right? They, all the demos that I have seen are using emails, but I foresee that there will be more channels available. And the agent is able like to reach out to the lead, respond to questions, book meetings, and uh, something important for all these agents, there's always the option of human interaction. So for instance, if you are you have an agent in a customer support channel and the query is not resolved, there's always the option to route the uh, request to a human service agent, right? And in this case, to a human sales agent so that it can be, the conversation can be continued if the agent is not able to respond. And the other one, sales coach, it's more like an internal one because it's a, a trainer, that helps sales agents practice their sales pitches to um, uh, to close specific deals, right? It's like a, a coach that allows you to do some role plays. Like you can, you can you switch on your camera and your microphone and you start to try to sell whatever products you want to sell. And then it gives you feedback and uh, coaching on how to perform better to close your deals. So really interesting, these two, uh, stay tuned because they are coming out really soon. Then I mentioned the second difference between Copilot and uh, agents is that we introduce this concept of topics. Okay, so topics could be something like order management, repairs, general FAQ. Today we are going to use a Coral Cloud Resorts, which is one of our new sample apps, which is a um, fictitious hotel resort chain app. And there we are going to see topics such as experience management to manage the experiences that guests can have at the hotel or booking, uh, bookings management to manage the bookings that um, uh, users can do at the hotel chain. So it's everything, uh, it's always like a job that the agent can do for you. And each job obviously is going to have different actions available because it doesn't need the same type of actions to do order management than to do general FAQ. Then, very important, and what's the uh, really the the uh, the the magic in all this is 
how you define each topic's scope and instructions. So scope and instructions are uh, the description of that, of that job that needs to be done. If there are any limitations or any uh, requests that you don't want that topic to respond to or to perform. And then the instructions. The instructions help the agent elaborate the right plan of actions. The instructions many times are going to be if the uh, user asks for this, first execute this action and second execute this second action because these actions are meant to be executed one after the other. Things like that. It's going to be like a really um, uh, recommendations of how the agent can plan better to fulfill the request. And then uh, we have actions. Actions, we already had them in Copilot. If you've seen some Copilot content, you will know that there are some standard actions. The difference here is that the standard actions for the different out-of-the-box agents are not the same. So the internal Copilot agent has different standard actions than the external ones. And this makes sense because they are like vertical agents and also because of um, the user authentication context. We will talk about that later. And then you can create custom actions with Apex, with Flow, and with prompt templates. At the beginning, we used to talk about prompt builders and prompt templates like in a, a separate uh, in a separate manner in regards to to agent force, and it's true that you can use prompt templates without using agents at all. But they are really an important part of agents because it's the thing that is going to um, provide the agent the ability to talk to a large language model in a specific way, in the way that your administrators want. So it's important to also understand them in the context of a uh, prompt, uh, sorry, agent force. And I'm here, I'm seeing here some questions. So give me a second. I'm going to read them before continuing. Okay. So tricky question. We start, <laughs> we start with, <laughs> thank you, Christopher. I love tricky questions. Uh, is it planned by Salesforce to disclose how the Atlas reasoning is working under the hood? Okay, um, there is a blog post out there with some information and I will be sharing it uh, later. I don't know um, to which level they are going to disclose the information. I guess they won't disclose everything, but we, we try to be open uh, most of the times and, and explain how things really work behind the scenes. So I expect to see some session as Trailblazer DX that go more in depth into, into how this works behind the scenes and also think that the product is evolving. It's evolving a lot. It's evolving. You don't know how fast it's evolving. I'm creating a video and the second later is outdated. So I can foresee like many iterations in this and many innovations. Um, then we have a question from Walter. Nice to see you there, Walter. Scope instructions look a bit like smart business rules. Is that right? Honestly, I don't know what smart business rules are. I don't know if it's something uh, from the CRM, something that I don't know, maybe, because I'm... So I've been a developer for ISVs almost always, and the standard functionality, I have to say that, like, uh, I don't know, uh, sales cadences in sales cloud, all those things that are a little bit niche. I don't know them like very, very well. So um, I'm sorry if it's something Salesforce related. If not, uh, I, I'm i not familiar with the concept, concept so I, I cannot tell you. Um, there is, uh, okay, Walter says a bit like if then instruct. Yeah, instructions. So think that, we're going to talk about how uh, agent force works in a second, but the first step that the agent is going to do is when it picks a topic, it's going to send 
the large language model that is using behind the scenes, the definition of the topic with all its instructions. So the uh, model is going to use all those instructions to elaborate the plan of actions and return it to the model. So yes, it's something like that. And then there is a question from Chaitanya. Is it right to assume that copilot agents are more suitable to be used within Salesforce ecosystem and agent force agents are better suited to host externally? I wouldn't say so. Is you can host agents externally, of course, but you can host them in your uh, regular customer support channels. So we're going to see an example of service agent today in which we hosted in an experience cloud site. And you can use service cloud for that, right? Let's be smart and use the technology that we have already there. So you could definitely use them outside of Salesforce, but the idea is that you expose them so external customers can, can contact you. Um, okay, we are going to continue. That's a really good comment, Keith. So Keith said that the beauty of this is that you don't have to configure all the logic Okay, now I understand what you meant with if this, then that. You don't need to configure all the paths, right? In all bots, you had to configure all the possible routing paths and say, if the customer asks this question, then you go this way, and then you go this way. And it's like very limited because you have to program everything. But here, you just give some instruction and it's the uh, the agent that the entity that uses artificial intelligence to chain the actions in a way that's meaningful. Okay, fantastic. So third uh, difference, the Atlas reasoning engine. You've been asking about this. This is the orchestration engine uh, that is able to communicate with users and with large language models to generate a plan and execute actions is not only generating the plan but also executing the actions so what does it have um, topic classification first thing is the first step that the atlas reasoning engine is gonna do is this is what the user asked which topic do i need to use from the ones that i have available because you assign topics by agent then um, we also discovered, not, my, not I, but the research teams discovered that uh, before we were following a uh, prompt engineering technique called a chain of thought that was less effective than the one that we're following now with Atlas, which is called a React prompting. Here you have an implementation detail, and this is better explain in the blog post that I will share. Then uh, we also experimented that um, it's uh, the agent results as are much better if we use a large language model to craft the agent responses based on history. Copilot didn't work this way. So Copilot responses were tied to actions and really very limited, right? Because each action like couldn't take a look at the whole history of the conversation, but now uh, that's possible thanks to an architecture change that we did. And then uh, we also discovered that if the agent asks the LLM to explain why are you picking this action and why are you elaborating this plan, the LLMs hallucinate much less, okay? So that's that's something um, uh, interesting and uh, something that's implemented into the heart of the Atlas reasoning engine. So um, ah, and something about the Atlas reasoning engine. So uh, you may have seen uh, Dreamforce keynotes in the Dreamforce keynote, and 
you've seen some slides in which we uh, say that the LLAS reasoning engine uh, learns from interactions with customers. And I haven't included a topic here because this is not DA in all the years. This is in development, but it's the idea. It's how it's going to work. So the idea is that the engine is going to learn from customers interaction and that's going to be available uh, also uh, uh, soon. So in summary, how does it work? Um, so the conversation starts at the moment. The entry points are always a user that asks the agent for something, right? When sales SDR agent is out there, the entry point is going to be different. It's going to be an automation, right? Because we are going to start proactively the conversation with the lead from uh, whatever rules we set up. But for service agent and for copilot is somebody goes and asks the agent something. So what the Atlas reasoning engine does is it sends the context to the LLM. And this uh, includes uh, what the user mentioned and also the topics that the agent has available. So the LLM clarifies or understands, it's able to understand the intent of the request and it's able to select a topic based on that intent and it's able to say, okay, uh, agent, you need to use this experience management topic to respond this question because this is what the user are meant to do. Uh, and uh, then once the topic is selected, we um, query the LLM again and send the topic with the instructions and the actions that are available for that topic. The LLM then uh, selects the actions, elaborate the plan of actions that needs to be executed, and then it executes it. In the middle of all this process, uh, there may be moments in which the agent needs more information from the user. For instance, it could happen that um, when the user first requests something, it's not clear enough to the large language model which topic to assign it to. So it may happen that the agent asks, what do you mean with this? Do you mean uh, that you want to work with bookings at Coral Cloud? Things like that. And also, while it's executing the actions, it may happen that some of the actions need user input. And it may happen that at some points, the agent asks you for more information. For instance, what's your user ID? Or you're, you're going to see some examples now with the demo. And finally, completes the task and it responds, elaborates a response, again, using a large language model. So architects, developers, and admins, how do we configure agents with these three agent force developer tools? Prompt Builder, we already covered Prompt Builder in a previous presentation. Model Builder, Model Builder is a tool that allows you to connect to your own models um, in Salesforce. So if you have a private OpenAI account, if you have a fine-tuned model, you can connect it through model builder and agent builder, which is the builder in which we are going to focus today. And with that, let's go into a demo and you're going to understand this much better. Let me move this to the bottom and let me close this. Okay, so here I'm going to make this bigger. Okay, I have uh, a couple of agents that I have created. Look that. When you activate agents, you always have available the Einstein Copilot agent. This is what we call the employee copilot, the one that is meant to be used inside of the org. Uh, but uh, to show something different today, I've created a, an agent force service agent, which are the ones that you expose 
through um, various channels so that your customers can ask you questions. So the best way to see the agent is in Agent Builder. So we open the agent here. And what we see here on the left are the topics that this agent is able to work with. So remember, topics are jobs to be done. So for instance, one topic is experience management. Why? Because we are using Coral Cloud. Coral Cloud, if you don't know it, is a sample app that we recently released uh, at Reinforce, really that is um, uh, a sample app to, to showcase agents and data cloud, mainly. So if you haven't taken a look at it, take a look at it because you have like a lot of great information in this app and it's, it's really, really handy. Well, I, I will share some resources and some tips to get started. With, with it before, but know that Coral Cloud is a sample app for a fictitious hotel resort chain. So uh, in the resort, there are experiences that people, activities that people can register for. So here, this topic is meant to use customers with experience management. For instance, we say this topic addresses customer inquiries and issues related to booking experiences at Coral Cloud Result, including making reservations, modifying bookings, and answering queries about experience details. So that's like the bit that the model is going to use to say, okay, what the customer wants to do can be done if I use this topic. Then the scope, it's like, what the agent is able to do, and also what you don't want it to do. If you don't want it to do something like uh, that it's in a gray area, you can put it here. For instance, here we say, the agent's job is to assist users in navigating and managing booking for different experiences, ensuring a seamless customer service experience, whatever, whatever. And then one of the most important parts are the instructions, okay? The instructions, well, before showing to you the instructions, I'm going to show you the actions because each topic has instructions and has actions. So here we assign some actions to the topic. Indeed, we have four flow actions, these four here, and we have one apex actions get experience details, get sessions, create experience booking, get customer details and generate personalized schedule. If we don't give instructions to the agent, it's going to be harder for, for it to elaborate the action plan correctly. But if we do something like this, so the, the most instructions that you provide, the better, even if it's a little bit repetitive, uh, it's going to, to understand the tools that it has available and how to change them much better. So for instance, we say, if a customer wants more information on activities, you should run the action, get experience details, and then summarize the results. Always ensure that you know the customer before running this action. Why are we adding that here? Because when you are exposing an agent on an experience cloud site, it may happen that you have an an authentic an an authenticated user, somebody who whose identity you don't know, right? So it's important. There are some security best practices that we need to follow when we create agents, and we are uh, working on a blog post to help you with that. Um, Next instruction, if the customer is not, is not known, you must always ask for their email address and membership number, and then run this flow to make sure that there is a user in the org with this, uh, with this um, uh, email and, and ID. Uh, next instruction, if asked to get sessions for the experience, use the get sessions action. Ask for the date of the session if it's not provided. Use the ID of the experience from the get experience details action. So all these e instructions, 
you're going to find them testing your agent. So you first time that you create your agent, it's probably not going to work as you expect. And then you are going to start playing with instructions. And then you are going to see that this is the way to go. The way to go is to specify like really good instructions that tell the agent what, what to do, right? That helps a lot. And, and yeah, and I think I'd mostly explain this. So let's test out our agent and then we are going to take a look at the different, how things are working behind the scenes. And I have some more technical information also to share with you. So now our agent, well, we can test it here. So the idea would be, this is the place where I can like iterate and improve my agent, but I've also exposed the agent in a site in Experience Widdler. Why? Because it's an Einstein service agent. So if I click here on view site, we're going to see that there is a, like a widget where a customer, a fictitious customer, could talk to other, our agent. Well, maybe we're going to see it, maybe not. <laughs> Come on. Well, mean, meanwhile, this loads, I'm going to show you what the agent did behind the scenes. So this is another reason agent builder is very useful because it helps you debug what the agent did, right? So what did it, it did do? Well, everything started with a user prompt. Can you let me know about the underground cave exploration? And then remember, what's the first thing that we do? Select a topic, right? So it selected the right topic, experience management. The topic has these instructions and these actions. And this is what the Atlas reasoning engine shared with the model. And then uh, the, mod the model, uh, sorry, the, the engine was able to follow those instructions to realize that we don't know the identity of the user. So this is one of those interaction points in which we are asking the user to gather more input because we want to know the identity of the user. Um, Okay, let me see if I can fix this one second. Because I want to show you the experience builder site, which is also nice. Meanwhile, I'm going to, to provide here an email address and a membership number. And we're going to see what the agent does now. Okay, so user prompt, it selected the right topic. And now it had an instruction, remember, that said if the user tells you uh, it's email and membership number, use get customer details, which is a flow action. We can open um, Let me open flow here and show you the flows are not complicated, okay? are really easy. and I'm going to share later a trailhead module where you can complete all this yourself. But I'm going to show you at least one. It was get customer details. Okay, it's just um get records um get records action that verifies that the user exists in the system. So it did that, and then it had an instruction that if they ask the user is asking for experience and we 
identify the user this way, we can give details about the experience that is happening. And get experience details is another action which is retrieving the experience information in Flow. So what it did was to give a better description of what we have on the record because we instructed that also in the instructions and explaining what the underground cave exploration activity is. And additionally, is asking me if I want to know about the available sessions that are happening for this experience. Um, yes, I would like to see sessions for tomorrow, okay? So we can do something like this. Meanwhile, let me see if I can already open the site. There it is. Okay, here we have exactly the same experience. This is the agent, but exposed in a class, in a customer uh, experience cloud site. And we could do exactly the same, but I like doing it in the builder because that helps me see like all the different actions that are being executed behind the scenes. You see also that it was able to get the different sessions that are happening for the underground cave exploration tomorrow. Okay, tomorrow. And uh, it's telling me, would you like to book this session? If so, please let me know the number of guests. Yes, for two guests, please. We can do something like this, okay? And hopefully it will be able to book the session for me. There it is, okay? Your booking for the cave exploration session uh, was successful and it called create experience session booking. So very useful. And again, we can do exactly the same here. The difference is that <clears throat> here we, we, we really don't know who is asking. And um, you see um, uh, that now it gives me, it is the same experience as before. Yes, tell me the sessions for tomorrow. And we can follow like kind of the same um, workflow. Hope it 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 uh, is clear. So um, what else do I wanted to share here? The apex, the apex uh, action. You can find it. So everything that I have shown, it's in the Coral Cloud app. And you can also get it if you complete a trailhead module called Build Your First Agent with Agent Force. Okay. And if you want to take a look at the class, it's... Uh... All right. One second. Personalize, get experiences. Is this one okay? It's just an invocable, an invocable action, okay? Where we receive the inputs, the inputs that we define in the agent actions, and we return a response setting the output. By the way, I showed how to assign actions, here it is, how to assign actions here, but I didn't show you how to create actions, okay? You can do, do that in two ways. You can create the action from here, like new at action, and then you, you select the apex, the flow, the prompt template that you wanna link, and you create the action from here, or you can go to agent, actions and configure your actions from here. You can create new actions or you can take a look at the ones that are available. It's also very important that your actions have like a good description. The better you describe the actions, the topics, everything, 
the, the better it's going to work. And in the action definition, you define the inputs that need to map the inputs that you use in your flow or the inputs that you use in your apex and the outputs, which again, need to map whatever you define in your flow or your apex. And here you can configure some things such as if you want to require this input, if you want to collect this data from the user, for instance, and for the outputs, you, you can uh, check, for instance, if you want to show the output in the conversation. So it's not only defining the flow or the apex class, it's all also defining the action, which is a metadata type. I'm going to talk about metadata types also right now. Um, great. So do you have questions till this point? Because I'm going to continue explaining some of the um, technicalities of, of agents and how they are implemented behind the scenes. I don't see any questions in the chat, but so I think you can continue, Baba. Okay. Uh, thank you, Vishal. That's a really great point. Is talking about how important it is to properly structure prompt and instructions. That's a skill. It's a new skill that we all need to learn. Uh, my husband created his first agent um, like five days ago. And at the beginning, he was, this is not working. This is, uh, doesn't do what I wanted to do. And then he really spent time like learning a little bit of prompt engineering and refining his instructions. And then he was super excited, like, this is fantastic. <laughs> so it takes time. And also we need to uh, think that the, the, there's going to be always a percentage of error. Like generative AI is not 100% accu accurate as a, a custom software developed app could be, but the benefit that you get is immense because it's like you are delegating the implementation of your custom app to that agent and maybe 80% or 90% of the cases is going to, to resolve your query correctly. So, so it's important to understand that and to iterate and to really learn these new skills, which are uh, really, really um, important. Vishal is saying, are you referring to prompt engineering to improve this skill from an architecture perspective? Yes, of course, of course. We need to really uh, learn how to talk to large language models in a way that they understand us better, right? Or for instance, with, with better English in my case, right? That I'm not a native English speaker. That's like super important because if, if, if you don't like, use the language correctly, it's, it's going to struggle to understand you. Um, good. So let me uh, continue with the slides and then we can go back to this is if, um, well, let me explain to you one more thing. So we talked about the experience cloud site. This is experience cloud site in which I embedded a widget called embedded uh, messaging. But to get this widget working, you need to configure Service Cloud, basically. And uh, the agent that I showed today, you can build it using following this Trailhead module, build your first agent with Agent Force. But you will only build the agent and publish the experience cloud site. The actions are, are already made for you and the service cloud setup is already done for you. But if you want to go deeper, I have here the instructions to configure service cloud, okay? These uh, instructions are part of a workshop, is the AI Now Tour workshop that we've been running 
um, in many cities with being updating it with every feature that has been released. And the last update that we have included is the uh, inclusion of service agents. So if you do the trade head module and you say, okay, I did this part, but the service cloud configuration was like magic. I want to know how to do that. Then you come here to the workshop and you have all these steps to configure omnichannel and configure all the routing because we, we route requests in this experience cloud site in a way in which they first go to the agent, the autonomous agent and the AI agent. And if the agent is not able to, to resolve the query, then is routed to a real user on uh, who's watching the service cloud console. And the configuration is, is long, okay? That's why we don't make you do it on the trade head module. I wouldn't say it's difficult, but it's long. So if you are interested and you want to take a look at that, I will share this workshop instructions with you. That by the way, they are not public yet. They are, uh, we're, making them public tomorrow. <laughs> but I talked to my manager and he told me it's fine. It's one day before you can share it with them and, and that's perfectly fine. So you can use it today. Uh, and, and here you have like a lot more, okay? Here you have an, an exercise, a couple of exercise for agents. This is more internal agents. And then a couple of exercise for service agent, even some exercise for retrieval augmented generation with data cloud, which is a whole other story that we could have um, a session, a three hour session about it and, um, and more use cases, okay? Take a look because it's, it's really, really um, useful this workshop if, if you want to follow it and, and yeah. Take a look at that. So um, let me go to the slides. I'm going to share a few more things and then I will respond to your question shyless, okay? So uh, how is this implemented under the hood? There are some S objects that you can query through, the, uh, through SQL, for instance, which are these ones here. So um, basically, each well, each agent is an Einstein bot. I don't have the Einstein bot um, object here, but each Einstein bot is. I don't have it because it was an object that existed before. But each bot or it's related to a planner. The planner is the uh, is like the engine, right? Is is the thing that is going to and define how this agent is going to work. So plugins are topics. I don't know why in Salesforce we rename everything, but know that plugins in the metadata are really topics. So each agent can have multiple topics. That, that's why we have a junction object. And then each plugin can have multiple instructions and instructions live in an S object and there is again a junction object that maps them. And then actions, like the actions that an agent can perform are functions, okay? In uh, the data model and also in the metadata types because there are a few metadata types that you, that represent the agent, right? and that you will need to retrieve and deploy if you want to move your agents from one or to another. And the ones that you need to use are bot and bot version. This existed before, but it's like the shell in which we have implemented agents. And then we have the planner. We have plugins, which are topics. We have functions, which are actions. <laughs> and if your agent is using a uh, prompt template actions, there is also a metadata type. Uh, this is wrong. It's Gen AI. Okay, Gen AI from template. Uh, 
sorry, that it is. Uh, so those would be the metadata types that you need to move. Now, this is enough if you are working with an internal agent. If you are working with an agent that's exposed through Service Cloud to Service Cloud, then you need to move like a couple more things. And I'm working on a blog post to, to explain all this because it's not very clear, it is, it's not well documented and, and people really need some clarity on that. But I'm waiting for um, some product managers to, to finish on some refactoring that they are doing internally so that I can provide a little bit more information because they are working on a scratcher support and packaging. So uh, scratchers, we uh, said in summer uh, that uh, we were supporting Copilot in scratchers and there is a Copilot feature that activates it. But when we expanded the concept of Copilot to agent force, then it's um, like it's supported only the employee Copilot thing. So if you want to, de to deploy agent, to enable agents in scratchers is not uh, possible right now. And the team has decided uh, that they want to like deprecate the copilot feature and create some agent force ones, uh, one for each out of the box agent. And they are working on that right now. That's why I haven't published the, the blog yet. Um, we are going to expose the activation of prompt builder and prompt templates as well. And we're working on that. And what I have been told is that we are going to add limits so that you cannot like it's, it's it's each scratcher is going to have limits on the number of generative AI requests that you can do and so on. And then for packaging, uh, all these uh, metadata types are packageable theoretically in a managed packages. But uh, then if you're thinking about second generation packaging and first generation packaging. Well, in first generation packages, uh, we only support internal employee copilots. And we are really working on second generation packaging because what everyone should be doing instead of using all technologies. And I'm, I'm also trying to, I will share an update on this um, at the times that it advances in, in the upcoming days or weeks. Um, great, uh, something to bear in mind everything that all the uh, calls that we do to the large lang la large language models that are being used behind the scenes always go through the Einstein trust layer. You know, it's a security layer in which we follow a series of, of steps to ensure um, the security of your requests and your responses. And in the Einstein trust layer, you can activate something called audit and feedback. Audit and feedback, uh, well, audit is a feature that uh, logs the history of all the interactions that happen with the model. And it could be really useful to, to see what's the usage of generative AI that's happening on your OR, and also to refine your models if you are using a custom a large language model connected through Model Builder to observe how data masking is working, for instance, for uh, protecting sensitive data and so on. And if you activate audit trail, uh, the data is stored in data cloud objects. So it consumes data cloud credits, obviously, and also feedback. Feedback can be provided um, uh, like on purpose because we, the user says, okay, I like uh, this response or thumbs down, I don't like it. But we are also storing feedback. Uh, how do we call it? Like, um, it's, it's not on purpose. It's like, uh, uh, I can't find the word, sorry, right now. Uh, but I'm going to explain you with, with an example. So for instance, uh, when you generate, we use a large language model to generate an email, you can send the email or you can edit it, right? So if you edit it, if the user edits the email, we store that as a piece of feedback because we know that their response was not perfect, okay? So it's like hidden feedback that we store so that our users have more information of the usage of generative AI 
that's happening in their orbs. And there are also some uh, data cloud model objects where all this information is stored. And I wanted to share uh, this because it may be interesting for architects uh, so that you know that you can query these objects. There are also reports and dashboards and so on, but you could create your own applications to, to query those objects and, and to use it to, to, to improve your prompts and improve your usage of generative AI. And now, last thing I wanted to share. So I've been talking about how service agents act, are exposed externally and you should have some extra additional uh, considerations regarding them, right? Um, first, first one, I already talked about it. You will need to uh, set up all the omni-channel functionality in service cloud and optionally experience cloud. That's just conf extra configuration step that you will need to use. And then how they execute. So if you are running an internal agent, the agent really runs under the platform integration user, runs your actions. For instance, when you run a flow action or an Apex action, the agent uses the platform integration user, but honors the user permissions. So field level security, record level security, and so on are respected. Indeed, um, until now, if you wanted to debug a flow action or an Apex action, you had to you to add debug logs for the platform integration user, but we are changing that. And in a few days or weeks, it's going to be the calling user. So we are changing uh, like even how logging works so that you have, so that it seems that the user is like 100% called by the user who invoked the action, okay? That's something to bear in mind. And then with service agents, it's different because when you create the agent, let me show you. Uh, let me show you agent. When you create a new service agent, Here you select the topics that you want the agent to have, and you select an agent user, okay? And that's the user with which your agent is going to run. So um, it's not the platform integration user anymore, it's an user that you select and you should follow the minimum privilege principle and assign the minimum privileges possible to that user profile or permission sets because it's something that is exposed externally and you, you need to be very careful with what you expose. And then um, if you use, you create custom flow actions or custom Apex actions, then our recommendation is that you uh, identify the user, you validate that the user exists in the org before performing any action, and also that you are conscious of what you expose and what you allow to do an external user in your org, okay? And because of that reason, internal agents have a lot of actions available that allow you to update records and create records and other things and qu even query records, but those actions are not available for service agents. You have other set of actions, but you don't have a generic query records action available for a service agent. Because if you allow your users to query your database, we want you to do it on purpose and to create your own flow or your own Apex class that is, uh, which scope is limited. Right, it's not open to querying all the database because it's external. And again, there is a blog post coming soon that my colleagues Stefan and Mohit are writing with a lot of security recommendations for this use case. Okay, that's super important. 
and I already talked about the workshop and how you can use it. So uh, I'm going to take a look at the chat now and we will finish with uh, the yeah, roadmap. I think, this, I think we only have one question that was not answered yet from uh, uh, Sherry Lesh. Can the output be formatted as HTML? Uh -huh. um, that's a good question. So at the moment, we don't have control over the uh, UI that agents use to uh, format uh, the response. I know that there are many things in the roadmap because we want to even allow you to create a Lightning Web component that you can put to surface the response of an agent so that you have more control of what it uh, responds. I haven't tried the HTML case concretely, but I would say it doesn't work because it would be probably risky, I would say, but I haven't tried. Uh, and then the second question, it is correct that the future state is that topics will be automatically created based on past data. Oh, sorry. Um, I haven't heard about that. I cannot talk about that because I haven't heard about that. That would be amazing. If we are working on that, that would be really amazing. I haven't seen any like thing like that in the roadmap yet. But who knows? <laughs> it would be nice. Yeah, I, I didn't see it either in the roadmaps, so yeah. I'm not sure. But there was mentioning, I think that's also what uh, Christopher meant earlier with his question, uh, mentioning of large action models that they're moving towards not only large language models, but also large action models uh, to create a more dynamic use of actions. So maybe even that it can, up, can come up with its own actions. Mm. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's impossible to uh, keep up with everything that's going on. It's it's crazy. You know yeah, how definitely. crazy it is. Um, there is uh, one question from Marcos. Is it possible to enforce user authentication instead of identification with email and membership number? Uh, I guess you could implement your own workflow, your own action to do that. Um, even you could restrict the agent operation, right? If you don't get to authenticate the user. Um, but we, we don't have uh, like a working example with that right now that I can show you, but it, it should be possible theoretically uh, to create because you can execute your own Apex classes. So think that Apex gives you like all the possibilities that you normally have in your regular uh, software applications because in Apex, you can invoke external APIs and you, you can do almost whatever you want. And Alex. Yeah, but then the, I think the tricky part would be that uh, since we don't have control yet over the UI that the agent uses, uh -huh. you, you would have to provide your password in the chat. And that yeah. would be not safe, I think. So I think for now, Marcus, uh, it would probably be limiting the channel where you publish your agents, that you say that you only publish the agents on an authenticated experience cloud site and not on a public site. So they always have an authenticated user because you know, as long as we don't have UI control on the agents, mm -hmm. you will have an issue uh, to provide the password, the password and username. Like the, the username is not that big of a problem, but mm -hmm. you don't want your password as plain text in the, in the chat with agent. Mm -hmm. You, you can always so there there are some like workarounds at the moment to overcome the fact that we cannot uh, like uh, change UIs. You could like redirect the customer to a you you could return a URL right and say go to this URL and authenticate, or you could send a platform event that launches a Lightning Web component and thus something for you but uh, what i would say is don't overdo it right now because salesforce is working on a lot of features at lightning speed 
and lots of things are are coming out really soon. So I would say like play with the technology, definitely understand it, but don't over engineer things because lots of things are coming out soon. Uh, okay, and Alex, you mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, that agents rely on the history of conversations for uh, better results. Is data from conversations retained? Yeah, so it's retained if you activate audit. You activate audit and feedback that's on... Mm -mm. Uh... Let me find it, this generative AI. You go to Einstein feedback, and then here you activate, connect, collect Einstein generative AI audio and data. And it's really interesting to take a look at this data because you can see all the interactions with generative AI that are happening in your org. All that, all those that come like from the models API and from prompt builder, and from agents, like from all the different inter from the standard out of the box functionality, and and you can see everything that's going on. Um, I understand that each agent retains history for its own session because it needs the session. Uh, uh, sorry, the history to be able to compute the final responses that it does. But in the sense of retaining it in the or in a way that you can see it, you need to activate it. And it's again, this is data cloud. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Yeah, one question from my side. Um, it, it would also be possible later on, maybe if you um, capture this audit data to provide corrections on the decisions of the agents that you can sort of retrain it. That's okay, the agent took decision A, but based on this context, I would have rather had it took decision B so that you can say like, please change this in the future that if you get a similar question, mm -hmm. uh, that you can provide like adjustments. Yeah, so if you're talking about what the planner is doing, I don't know if Salesforce will expose a way of providing feedback for that. But if you are talking about a custom model that you have connected to Model Builder, because remember that agent actions, agent actions can call prompt templates, right? And from tem in prom prompt templates, you can select which model you use. So we don't have control over which model the Atlas reasoning engine uses, but we have control of which models a prompt template uses. For instance, here, we can select a standard models, or you could select your own models connected through model builder. So you could fine tune your models using that or the data and correct and make your models better if you're using a custom one. Yeah, okay, so if you have a custom model and you invoke it uh, by the agents through a prompt template, then that's how you can fine tune the model basically and mm -hmm. how it works, okay. Yeah, another way you could invoke it is through an Apex action using the models API. Okay. Okay. Well, um, if there are no more questions, I can tell you a little bit about roadmap. So um, I mentioned that two sales agents are coming uh, really soon at the beginning of December. Then we are also releasing the agents API. At the moment, you cannot invoke agents through the API. There, there is a way to do it, like doing using Einstein bots, like in a really convoluted way, but we don't like officially support that. Uh, and we are releasing like a proper agents API, so you can invoke agents from multiple places. Uh, then with the release of uh, sales agents, we will be able already to trigger agents 
from business processes and we plan to open that up and allow you to trigger agents like from flow from uh, other our from other automations and entry points in the platform we are also working, and this is going to be huge, in a testing and evaluation framework for generative AI, because all the, the questions that all developers have uh, as of today is how do you test, how do you create an automated test for, for, an, for an agent, right? And, and, and we're working on, on something that will help you with that. It's not testing in the way that we know it, because you, you cannot test, you need to evaluate the accuracy of the response. But it's um, it's like what uh, the software industry is doing for for LLMs and generative AI. And, and we're going, I think for TDX or, or so, we will be already showing this in action. Then we're working on multi-intent support, which means at the moment, if the user requests one thing, the agent is very good in completing the task. But if it requests multiple things at the same time, it's, it's more tricky. So we are working on that. And multimodal support, support of images, audio, other types of content that is not only text. At the moment, the only way in which you can do something like that is in a custom way with the models API, uh, but we plan to support that in prompt builder and agents and so on. And then something that I read uh, in the blog post that I'm going to share about the Atlas reasoning agent is very interesting, which is the ability to in for different agents to interact among them, right? I don't know how will that work, but read it. There is a paragraph talking about that. And it's like, I see that like very far away in the future, but it, it like uh, creates like a really interesting uh, paradigm and it brings a lot of questions to, to your mind of how that would work. So um, the resources that I'm sharing today, the workshop that you are the first ones to, to have uh, today, uh, the Collect Cloud app. There is a um, quest that we are running in which you complete the module that I mentioned before, which is really easy. It takes one hour at most. Uh, and then if you create a video showing how you have expanded the agent with a custom action, a flow action, or an apex action that you create, then you enter in a raffle to win, I think it's a trailblazer hoodie, or no, it's an agent blazer hoodie and something, something else, okay? So take a look. And if you are interested, it could be like a fun challenge. And I'm sharing that here. From there, you can access the, the build your first agent trailhead module. And this is the, the blog I mentioned in which I share. I saw the uh, most public facing interesting details of the Atlas reasoning engine that you mentioned before. And I've shared the slides with uh, Abdel Hacking, so you can have them in the group. Okay. Any more questions? All right, thank you, Awa. Um, let's see, I don't see any more questions in the chat yet. And you know, how I about limits? It's and asking this. about the limits. The, the, Copilot has limits, of course. Oh, sorry, Agent Force has limits, of course. So you have, uh, for instance, limit on the tokens that uh, are, uh, are responsible. Not, not only agents, but large language models, right? Large language models limit the number of tokens of their request and response that you can produce. It's it's normal, like it's, it's not infinite. And also, uh, bear in mind, agents are in a in a widget on the on the UI, right? We don't want an agent to return uh, thirty thousand words because their response would be unreadable. So of course there are limits, but um, you need to play with them and 
and and try to provide like a good user experience and and uh, as well a reasonable use of of your generative AI resources. Um, Walter, this was extremely helpful. Thank you. I'm glad that you that you like it. And then San is the agent for going to help admins developer from Salesforce configuration perspective, like understanding Salesforce licenses and new feature. Oh, uh, I'm not sure uh, what you mean with that. If it's going to help, do you mean if, are you, are you asking about licenses that need to be used for agent force or if agent force can help you like configure your or somehow? Can you clarify that? You can also just uh, uh, unmute yourself. It's also fine. Uh, yeah, my question is uh, regarding the licensing because the Salesforce licensing is a bit complex to understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so can I interact with the agent force agent uh, to help the admin or developer yeah. understand better Salesforce configuration? Like if I struggle with some configuration, nowadays uh, we are using the chat GPT but uh, is it something similar can be provided by Salesforce? Because yeah, Salesforce documentation is quite vast and it takes a lot of time to understand, like go through, find the right resource, understand and make a config. Um... I, I know that Salesforce is releasing, I don't know if it's already there, but an agent in salesforce.com. Let me see. Okay, it's not there yet. But uh, it should be here soon because we've been asked to test it. And probably through, through that agent, you will be able to, to get some information. And, and it's a really good use case, a Salesforce to Salesforce on Salesforce use case that we could implement internally, of course. Um, I would say that licensing is like something, configuration, Yes, it's based on documentation, but licensing is something that you need to, to discuss with your account executive because it's complex. Uh, it's different for every customer because it's customer. each customer is unique and has unique needs. Uh, so I would say if you have licensing questions, it, I, I think it's in general better to talk to an account executive, but there will be an agent here soon to which you can probably uh, ask some questions as well. Uh, and there is another question from Shailesh. I did not see the choice of LLMs Azure OpenAI in AT&T Force. Yeah, so this is because there are two ways in which you can use, a, in which an agent can use a large language model, okay? One way is through its reasoning engine, which is Atlas. We don't have control of which models does it use because it's a really uh, complex uh, implementation that's internal and that we are not exposing, okay? And that we know it works well this way using these large language models. The second way in which you can use large language models in an agent is through a prompt template or an Apex class or a flow. In that case, if you are calling the models API or using a prompt template, you can choose your models, the models that you want to use. I hope that makes sense. I also have uh, one more question. When can we expect the uh, multi-agent models where the uh, Atlas is more like an almost becomes like a team lead, like an orchestrator that can uh, yeah, interact with a whole team of different agents basically in its in its own team. Did you really have the multi-agent model? Uh, mm -hmm. Also, uh, how we've seen um, not just for Salesforce but also in other articles around how they see that with agentic workflows that you have a whole team of agents, each with their own persona, mm -hmm. their own expertise their own actions. Yeah, that, that would be like the agent-to-agent -agent interaction capability that I mentioned. And I think that's like 
future. Like future. I I cannot tell you when because I, I don't know myself. Okay. <laughs> Another one for the multimodal support. Uh, I was recently at the Heart of Sur Service Summit in uh, Breda. Mm -hmm. And there uh, in the keynote, there was a demo where I did a, a handover where the agent force uh, agent interaction started with chat. And then at some point, the customer told the agent, like, hey, I have to get into my car because I have an appointment to get to. Mm -hmm. Can you call me back in five minutes? And then the agent called him back and continued the conversation. Will it also be supported straight away with the multimodal support or will it first only be that it can understand images, for instance, or I, video? Yeah, I think multimodal support refers more to the fact of uh, when you work with a model, generate something that's not not text, like images or music or, or videos. Uh, what you said sounds to me more like an out-of-the-box feature of the own, own agent service agent. And I haven't seen that working, but if you have been in a service cloud summit, probably you have more information than me about that topic Correct. because they, you know, they they are like more specific in in into these trainings and and whatever you saw must be in the roadmap. I cannot tell you right. uh, for when. I see. There's one more question in the chat, by the way, from uh -huh. uh, Shales. Uh, okay, then it is the case that the build your own model is not supported in agent force. Yes, it's supported, but it's supported through um, through model builder. So when you create an a agent action, let me go back to that again. I I was lost. Okay, here I have on builder. When you create agent actions, agent actions you can create prompt builder actions. Okay, I don't know if we have some here, no, but we can click on new and we can create prompt template actions. So if you have connected a custom model through model builder, you can use it in your prompt template. It's going to appear here. So you can definitely use your own models through from templates, and if you have an Apex action, I can show you. This is a code live we did two days ago, and in this code live, uh, a customer who gave a session at Dreamforce showed how to use um, some advanced use cases for developers, okay? for um, agents. And he showed how to create an Apex action that uses the model's API to invoke one model. And that model could be a standard model, or it could be a model that's connected to model builder. So this could be your own model. And the agent, when it executes that action, is going to use that model. So those are the, the two ways in which you can use it. But the internal engine, no, you cannot modify it because the internal engine is like tweaked and perfectly investigated and researched to work that way with the models that it uses internally and that are not exposed to customers. Okay. <laughs> Last question from Walter. Will you be at French Stout Dreaming? <laughs> I won't, but because I'm pregnant <laughs> and uh, I'm not traveling anymore, uh, it's just a few weeks to go, but I, thank you, <laughs> but uh, I would love to be there because it's been a couple of days, uh, of years that I don't go and it's definitely on my list for the future. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. One, one <laughs> last question from my side also, um, the uh, language support. So was mentioned that for now, I think we have uh, six languages. So uh, French, English, uh, German, Spanish, Portuguese, and Japanese, I believe. Mm -hmm. uh, but when will other languages be rolled out? Yeah. So let me show you something. Uh, 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 uh. This is actions. 
by the way, here I didn't show there are other options that help you. This this is new. This is all, allows you to upload documents and make your agent aware of documents. It indexes your document, it stores them in a vector database, and it allows the agent to search in your documents very effectively. Here you have the language support. Okay. So these are the language that are currently supported. Okay. English, UK, French, Italian, German, Spanish, Portuguese, French. And you can configure that for the agent and configure also the tone. Okay. Um, I don't know when the other languages are coming, but definitely on the roadmap. And I, I, I'm not a product manager, so I don't know the dates, but definitely something that we are working on because it's important. And, and, and yeah, and here you can find it's kind of the backlog. Okay. It's uh, like information of how the session went. And when you configure the agent, there is a setting called enrich event logs with conversation data that if you check, gives you more information uh, when you're taking a look at these event logs, something to bear in mind, okay?